What I'd like to talk to, about today is Adam Smith's The Wealth of the Nations and to talk about chapters one and three about the division of labor and about the extent of the division of labor. Just a simple presentation for what's going on in those books, a reinforcement if you have read the material, and an introduction if you haven't read the material. That's all. One of the common misconceptions about Adam Smith is that somehow he begins by arguing for free trade or that somehow he begins with the assumption of a free market. And he doesn't. Actually, in book one, chapter one, he starts off with the division of labor. After all, his concern is what leads to the wealth of nations. And in his case, it will be the productivity that the division of labor engenders. So, the division of labor. For Smith, actually, or in Smith's time, this seems to be a relatively new term. Mandeville talks about dividing labor, uh, and some earlier authors will talk about segmenting labor, but the phrase division of labor seems to be uh, new or uh, originated by Adam Smith. And what he's going to talk about here is the difference between somebody doing a project on their own and something we take for granted now a job to be broken down into its smaller parts. And the example that he uses in uh, the beginning of The Wealth of the Nations is a pin factory. So he says, well, consider uh, somebody making pins, individually making pins. What they will have to do is they will have to draw out the wire, they'll have to cut the wire, they then have to sharpen the wire, and then they have to make the head of the pin, then they have to paint it and put it in paper. Importantly, what also needs to be done as well is you can't do that all standing in one place. I will draw the wire here and maybe cut it. Over here is my grinder. Then over here is where to make the head of the pin, paint it, and then once again packaging over there. I need space for the work. This takes time. So a single individual moving between these time has to, or be, between these workstations will divide up their time not only between the actual work but between moving from task to task. Uh, a wonderful comment as well that Smith says is that people have a tendency to saunter between tasks. Uh, that is, they will dally just a bit. So they're not going to be in high speed running from task to task, and there'll be further time wasted in this sauntering. Anybody who has ended one task uh, on a computer program and surfed a little Facebook before they went on into their next task has engaged in this kind of sauntering. So just kind of our reluctance to move into a new task causes a further waste of time. And the other thing to realize too is that a jack of all trades is a master of none. That the dexterity of the worker is decreased because they're not specialized in any one thing. So I can do it, I can do it competently, but I'm not going to be an expert, I'm not going to have that kind of skill and speed as somebody who would specialize in something. And so Smith says something like an individual set on their own making pins could maybe make a few hundred pins a day. Not a shabby amount of pins, but nonetheless it's a few hundred. Now if we put one individual at each of the workstations, right, one individual's over here drawing out the wire and cutting it, somebody over here then, right, those is thrown into a bin, somebody here's taking out of a bin grinding it, somebody here's putting the head on the pin, and yet somebody over there is packaging the material, and getting it ready for shipment. Each of us specializes. We will become quicker in our manual dexterity as we learn how to do it, as anybody who's practiced any task knows. Furthermore, we're not wasting time walking around. And finally, we don't face that temptation to saunter because we're not sauntering. We, we have no opportunity to go off and do something else, to daydream. We are then focused on our task. And these individual elements will then lead us to individually work faster. But since also this is in a production line or, or, or some other institutional framework, uh, together we will be able to make thousands of pins, whereas an individual by themselves will only be able to make a few hundred. And this then will be the productivity that is occasioned by the division of labor. That will be our increase in our dexterity and increase in the time. We can then devote to our tasks and then this, all the benefits that accrue from having a specialty versus being a jack of all trade, which is why then the Wealth of Nations Book one, chapter one, deals with the division of labor because this will be the key. Uh, all else will hinge upon this.
So the division of labor is what leads to the wealth of nations. Now here's an important question. How much can we employ the division of labor? It's not just useful by itself in isolation from everything else. It's useful within a context. And that context is going to be the market. So this is a question that Smith asks actually in chapter 3. And I have to admit, the first time I read The Wealth of Nations, I thought chapter 3 was the most boring chapter in the world. Because Smith spends a lot of time talking about what it would cost to haul something to Leeds or Edinburgh by land versus by water. And he actually goes into how many carts it would take and how many horses. And it seems that he has just digressed on something that is irrelevant. But let me put it into context. Uh, not too long ago, a book was written by a man named Jared Diamond called Guns, Germs, and Steel. And basically, one of the conclusions that Diamond comes to is the fact that the reason that certain nations were so successful is because they had high population densities. Or not nations, excuse me, certain areas, uh, not nation states, but certain areas were successful because they had high population densities. And then he runs into a very uh, interesting problem. The question arises, well, what constitutes a population density? Uh, why isn't it just the whole Earth? Why, why is the relevant population that we're talking about here Western France? Why doesn't it include Eastern France? Or why is the relevant population London and not Edinburgh? And what he says is geographical barriers oceans or mountains tend to determine what the extent of any given population is. Actually, if we look at Jared Diamond in the context of chapter 3 uh, in The Wealth of the Nations, what we see is that what determines the population as Diamond's talking about it is transportation costs. In a time when you can't get over mountains or in a time when you can't cross oceans, they're prohibitively expensive. And so the populations are separate. But once the populations can communicate each other through regular traffic, either by ocean or by air, they become one. And this is exactly what Smith is talking about in Chapter 3, that a geographical area that's farther from London, say Edinburgh is farther than Leeds, is actually cheaper to trade with than it is to go over land by Leeds. So what you find is that the relevant market for the goods from London isn't determined by geographical closeness, it's determined by the cost of transportation. This then determines the size of one's market. That's why he's going into the cost. This is the point that Diamond actually misses when he's trying to determine what constitutes uh, a population. So it's the extent of the market determined by transportation costs that then determines the size or the ability of one to employ the division of labor. Smith is from Scotland. He makes the point that there would be no reason for anybody to engage in a pin factory in some of the highlands of Scotland when one's nearest neighbor is a few miles away. In an age before any sort of mechanized transport, that's a long way. A few miles is half a day, uh, perhaps, um, depending on, on the mode of transport. And you have a very light population density Maybe one has 10 neighbors who want maybe 100 pins each. That's 1,000 pins in any given point in time. There's no need for the excess production that the division of labor makes possible. The division of labor makes sense only when there are people or enough people then to buy the productive output that one engages in the division of labor. And now this is why transportation costs, this is why city, this is why population densities become so important. Because as the market expands, one can further divide labor. One can further divide labor because the excess productivity will be absorbed through the consumption of that market. And once you produce more, and Marx actually picked up on this too, once you produce more, you then also have an, ex uh, an incentive to expand your markets so that more people can buy your goods, so that you can further implement the division of labor, so that you can increase your productivity, but then you need to sell it, so you increase the markets. And now we have this sort of positive feedback cycle, where expansion of markets enable further division of labor and specialization, which enable further output, which demands bigger markets. And it's this kind of process, then, which Smith will argue when we talk of costs of trade, 
elements like tariffs and other trade barriers will come into this. And this is why Smith will then argue for an expansion of trade and an expansion of free trade so that a nation then may fully employ the division of labor that is according to its comparative advantage. But comparative advantage is something that I will talk about in another lecture.